Hi, Gregory Wrightstone here. Uh, thank you for joining me for the second episode of the Climate Chronicles. Uh, I had fully intention to have this episode devoted entirely to temperature and climate and how it related to the human condition and civilizations over the last several thousand years. I, however, got enveloped and twisted off when I got into recent temperature-related uh, events related to COVID-19, and uh, this will this episode will be devoted actually to temperature and uh, the coronaviruses and the seasonality of these things. So if we look at this, when we look at the seasonality of viruses, the, the early Greeks and Hippocrates were the first to uh, recognize the relationship between temperature and seasonality and the health of, their, of the citizens of, of Greece. What we look at today, this is a this is a graph of what the statisticians call it's rather a cold-hearted analysis. They call it excess winter mortality. In other words, there's a lot more death and mortality in the winter months as as the summer months. December, January, February, we see uh, increase in death. Uh, this is also from the United Kingdom. It's their Office for National T Statistics, looking at uh, data from the United Kingdom and Australia. And in this study, they found that 15 times as many people die with cold-related illnesses as they do heat-related illnesses. Thankfully, we have they they've recognized a decline in winter mortality, but even yet, in the United Kingdom, uh, we see that there's uh, 25,000 or so people die every year in the winter months. And again, this is what they call the winter, uh, excess winter mortality. The largest study of its kind was done by Dr. Antonio Gasparini and a team of doctors. Uh, they looked at 74 million deaths around the world uh, from 14 different countries and found that there were 20 times as many people the die due to cold is due to heat. So the other study was 15 times, this one's 20 times. Whatever the actual number is, it's a lot more people die because of cold than due to heat. And isn't that just opposite of what we're being told? And if you've listened to my interviews and, and presentations, you know that, that I say that a lot. It's just opposite of what we're being told. We see this time after time after time. As I got into this, a very recent report and study led by Dr. Moriyama out of Yale to, took a look at the seasonality of respiratory viral infections. This has just been, just uh, recently talking, uh, Dr. Oz has been talking about this uh, in the very recent past, uh, re referencing this report. In the beginning of the report, they've identified three factors that they say may be controlling the seasonality of the virus. Not just this virus, but the other re coronaviruses that are related to it. Those three are temperature, humidity, and vitamin D. Really fascinating, fascinating. And when we look at the seasonality of viruses, uh, the winter viruses, the ones we're talking about right now, flu, influenza or flu, COVID, which would be the in that family of of what we're talking about here in RSV, uh, they all have the seasonality between November and April. They appear in November and then disappear after a April. We can only hope that's the case uh, for this particular virus. Uh, other viruses of, of interest uh, have also have seasonality, but not necessarily the winter months. I was, the subtitle of this is, it's not the heat, it's the humidity not been clear there's not a consensus if you will on what causes the seasonality uh, this particular study points strongly at humidity being the, uh, the controlling factor in this and and they they gave a few reasons why humidity is one of the one of the items here because we look at it is it temperature if it's temperature well we spend most of our time or a lot of our time inside where, where it's temperature controlled uh, if you're outside all the time, of course, that would be different. But that can't explain how viruses don't get transmitted uh, with air conditioning and the like. So what they've said is that um, 
low humidity provides a clearer path for airborne particulars, particulars. And it, what they mean, it, it can travel farther uh, and more quickly in low humidity than it can with high humidity. And I think probably one of the more important reasons that they pointed to was the, the cilia in, in our lungs can't expel the viral particles in a, in a low humidity environment. And in addition, they said with a low humidity, their immune system ability to respond is greatly suppressed. Also, what's interesting, if you think about it, uh, in the winter months when you're inside and the heater's on and your, your furnace is going, we see that uh, the air outside is already cold and dry. We recirculate it, and then your heating system strips even more humidity out. Uh, according to this study, uh, humidity is reduced to around 20% in the winter months. Uh, and in fact, the, the lead doctor here says, that's why I recommend humidifiers during the winter in buildings. Fascinating. Might be a good thing to think about. Uh, according to the study, the sweet spot for the humidity was around 40 to 60%. The study they referenced with mice pointed to around 50% humidity that provided a a robust immune response. Another study that was published in, in early March, and one of the first studies on this relating temperature and humidity, uh, took a look at where the hot spots were at that time, and there was a fairly narrow band in the upper latitudes where these the really hot spots were blowing up. And, and they, they continued to be somewhat identified in those areas uh, with fewer uh, hot spots around the world. Uh, interestingly, my friends in Australia tell me that uh, when they had their first number of cases in, in Australia, uh, I was told by my, by my Australia friends that this was nearing the end of their summer down there and people were returning from all over the world from going on holiday and returning to the homes in Australia and probably uh, was the controlling factor for bringing uh, COVID-19 to Australia during what was then their summer months. Uh, but one thing we should also uh, quote that they said uh, from this study, they said that the family of coronaviruses has been shown to display strong winter seasonality between December and April, and this is key, and are undetectable in summer months in temperate regions. We can only hope that that will be the same case for what we're looking at. And another fascinating study, now this was published in 2006, uh, this relates vitamin D uh, to flu epidemics. Fascinating reading here, solar radiation triggers robust seasonal vitamin D production. They also noted that vitamin D deficiencies prevalent in the winter. Activated vitamin D has a profound effect on the human, human immunity. In the report, they have a chart here, they, they did extensive testing on vitamin D levels in, in the United States. Uh, this showed drastic decline of vitamin D levels in the blood uh, from this study group uh, in the winter months, uh, escalating into the July peaks in July, August for vitamin D. Again, they pointed to vitamin D having a big, big effect on human immunity. Um, one of the key takeaways here, which was fa fascinating to me, was that uh, low vitamin D levels are particularly endemic among the elderly during the winter months. And the elderly, it turns out, as you age, you s produce less and less vitamin D. Uh, they stated that the elderly make only 25% of the vitamin D as do 20 years, 20 years old after the exposure to the same amount of sunlight. So, it could well be that, that our, our elderly are most, well, it couldn't be, according to this, it, it's a fact that the elderly are exposed to these vitamin D deficiencies more than the rest of us. They also stated that we acquire most of our vitamin D from sun exposure. Their study didn't indicate that daily supplementation had a very big effect on wintertime insufficiency. I take vitamin D every day. I'm going to continue. I might even step it up a little bit. Uh, but again, they're pushing sun exposure. And, and what they also said was the sun, it's not just the sun exposure, but the more surface area of your skin you can expose to sun, the more vitamin D you can soak up. Again, I had, I had started uh, my 
my study on this, trying to relate uh, the big temperature changes over the last several thousand years to humanity. Uh, and as I got into it, it, it does appear, I'm sure, that during the uh, last several thousand years, they also had seasonality uh, of diseases that were worse. But uh, the big population losses appear more due to severe climate change and how it impacted uh, uh, crops, increase in famine, and the, and the like during the cold periods. And we'll be exploring that uh, in, a, in an upcoming uh, cl uh, Climate Chronicle episode. Thank you for joining me. You can learn more. And if you like these charts, we'll have them available. All the charts in this presentation will be available at my website, which is inconvenientfacts.xyz.